me to go in and blow something up, if I can do that. If you need me to go in and secure an airfield or a port, I can do that. It's just pick the one and send us. Who are these elite forces who established the first American base in Afghanistan? And how are they likely to change the war against international terrorists? They don't know where they are. They don't know what they're going to do, and that's good. We are dirty fighters. We are simply dirty street fighters. Go, 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 pick up. How are these Marines and their families reacting to the tragedy of September 11th? You can't dwell on it. You know, you've got to go on with everyday life. This shot, and now it's not much as a fear, but it's something we got to get settled. We want to measurably respond to ensure they understand you better never, ever, ever come to our house again. This is the story of how one special military unit is responding to the crisis and answering America's call to arms as the tip of the spear. Special operations units are on the front lines of the war against international terrorism in Afghanistan. And there's been very little access to them for obvious security reasons. But MSNBC was able to produce this exclusive profile of one of these elite units since its deployment to the Middle East, just two weeks after the September 11th tragedy. We agreed not to disclose troop locations or movements until after they had already been released by the Department of Defense. The U.S. Marine Corps and Navy allowed our team to travel and live with the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit from the time they said goodbye to their families in North Carolina through their secret desert training in the Middle East to establishing the forward base in Afghanistan. Tonight we are a country awakened to danger and called to defend freedom. September 20th, 2001. The same day President Bush outlines America's response to the September 11th terrorist attacks, 2,200 Marines and sailors with the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit board ships in North Carolina. Our grief has turned to anger, and anger to resolution. Whether we bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. The Marines of Lima Company are ready to do whatever mission is uh, handed down to us. Just hope that uh, everything goes well and come back safe and everything. They're bound for the Middle East on a regularly scheduled deployment, which since September 11th has been anything but routine. It's not training this time. This is a real situation we're going into. You know, of course, the September the 11th is on everyone's minds, um, and it's always at the back of my mind. You always have that uncertainty of anything could happen, because that's why they deploy. And so when things do happen overseas, that they're there. In 83, it was Lebanon as the peacekeepers and the first US military victims of Middle East terrorism when their barracks were bombed. In Operation Desert Storm in 91, as part of the Allied forces liberating Kuwait, and later called in to rescue the Kurds from Iraqi attacks. They were the first ashore in Somalia to battle the warlords and protect the relief efforts in 93. Sent into Haiti in 94 to help keep the peace between warring political factions. To Bosnia in 95 to rescue downed pilots. Albania in 97 to evacuate American citizens under fire and to Kosovo in 99, with the UN forces to restore peace and order. Marines can do everything from take care of the, the sick, or the starving, to punching somebody's lights out. In 1995, Major General Martin Berndt was the commander of the expeditionary unit and the recovery team that went into Bosnia to rescue Captain Scott O'Grady, the downed Air Force pilot. It was the only American ground unit to engage the Serbs. He is now the commander of the Marine Expeditionary Forces based at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, which trains and sends expeditionary strike forces, including the 26th, to troublesome 
Africa, and Europe. We really are in many ways a utility infielder. Uh, everything from uh, reinforcing an embassy to combat, conducting a, an evacuation of non, providing humanitarian assistance uh, to conducting amphibious raids. Their ability to move around that sea unencumbered by some of the, the politics and diplomacy that's necessary to get forces ashore. Uh, they provide a, a great deal of uncertainty in the, in the minds of people that would, would harm us. Embarked aboard amphibious ships, we don't get in anybody's way. They don't know where they are. They don't know what they're going to do, and that's good. We are dirty fighters. We are simply dirty street fighters. They're also the spouses, parents, and children of American families who have a personal stake in this crisis. Yeah, it's a little different because um, of what's happened to our country, and it's, and it's scary too as a wife. Well, I'm kind of nervous because he might, you know, be going to war. I'm afraid he won't return. When I watched my husband leave for Vietnam, of course it was emotional. Now, to see my children leave, especially John, him being my youngest, when he left, it was very emotional for me. I was a Marine, I was a Marine officer, but to send your son to war was a very, very difficult thing, and I realized, my God, how the real heroes are the, are the women who stay behind, the mothers and the dads who, who have to suffer this protracted un uncertainty. We are the 911 force of the country. We are most ready when the nation is least ready. The 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit called a MU, is a special operations capable unit stationed aboard three ships with the Navy's 6th Fleet, which has been sent into the crisis area. A totally self-contained force of infantry, armor, artillery, helicopters, and fighter jets. They travel with enough combat and medical support to be able to execute any one of its 20 different combat, rescue, or humanitarian missions with only six hours notice. We first came out, none of us were expecting anything to happen. It was supposed to be hitting ports and doing a lot of training overseas. But uh, now the whole situation's changed, and you know we could go into a real world crisis now. And I mean, we're ready for it. If, if anything happens, we're ready. Life aboard the ships for the Marines is the classic rendition of the military's hurry up and wait. Hey, this is a great ship, but the field environment is the best environment. That's when Marines are earning their money, doing, their, doing the thing that make them Marines. This is just waiting and go. Those living aboard the USS Bataan amphibious and helicopter assault ship have it best, since it's one of the Navy's newest ships, complete with air-conditioned living quarters, a store for buying personal items, a fully equipped weight room for maintaining their fitness, and a shipboard television network with 24 hours of entertainment, sports, and news. Corporal Zabrim Bonse is from New York City and was home on leave September 7th, taking pictures of the World Trade Center. I decided to stop in Manhattan like I always do, and I uh, took a picture on my back of, of the Trade Centers. And then a couple days later, I got, got to witness the Trade Center attack that's following Tuesday. I didn't learn till probably, I think it was the night that I was leaving it, uh, to jump on the ship that uh, I spoke with my father and he told me that, you know, you had a cousin that came to the States not too long ago. He died in the Trade Center uh, attack. She was shocked and now it's, it's kind of, it's not much as a fear, but it's something we got to get settled. And I said, to all Marines, it's, it's not an act of revenge, it's our job. The country calls on us. And it's, we're here to protect the country. And we're standing by until we get that call. A flag raised over the World Trade Center ruins by New York firefighters during the recovery effort was flown out to the aircraft carrier leading the military response into the crisis area with its Marine Expeditionary Unit. It was raised in a solemn ceremony as the new battle standard in America's war on terrorism, wherever it takes all who have responded to this latest call to arms. 
know, it's just so many things up in the air right now. We don't know who the terrorists are, when they're coming at us next, um, and that's, it's the unknown, it really is. Up next, the war on international terrorism heats up as the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit steams closer to the conflict. It is 10 days since they left their base in North Carolina and crossed the Atlantic. Now the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit reaches the Mediterranean and continues onward to the Middle East, final destination unknown, as America's roving 911 strike force for the next six months. Copy that. Control for aircraft three, fuel for aircraft three, three. Keeping to their special operations charter, they travel with their own aviation complement of helicopter transports, gunships, and the vertical takeoff Harrier attack jets for supporting their ground units and forward reconnaissance. Cover the SOP. I think I'd put a little more effort on, on uh, studying like some of the threats that maybe uh, faced with that probably wouldn't have put as much effort into before, you know, what kind of you know, missile defense systems these other countries have and, and things like that. Harrier pilot captains John Ferguson and Brad Brennan would probably be the first to enter hostile territory and are taking this deployment much more seriously, just like their friends and families back home. I'm getting emails, calls from people I haven't heard from, seen in a long time, uh, showing support, you know, wishing us well, which is really nice. It's a much different public response than during Vietnam, when their fathers were marine aviators serving a deeply divided country. He got out in the uh, early 70s, and he said when he came back to the United States, you know, he, he got a job flipping pizzas and pumping gas, and that's the only job he could get, and it was kind of a disgrace, he felt. So we talked about that. So did Corporal Chris Spiegler with his Vietnam veteran father. He considers this deployment to be somewhat of a delayed validation of his father's previous commitment to his country and the Marine Corps. He'd tell me what it was like back then in the 60s and how he'd come home and, you know, people, you know, they'd call him a baby killer or, you know, any, you know, bad things like that. And he's really proud, basically. You know, I come home and the town has a parade. Corporal Spigler is now a crew chief on the same type of helicopter his father flew as a Marine in Vietnam. There's only uh, four females on the ship right now in the marine element that have the probability of seeing combat, and those are your uh, flyers, which there are four of us. As a helicopter crew chief, Corporal Jennifer Weiss is responsible for all of the mechanical and electrical operations on her craft, as well as manning the 50 caliber machine gun that protects it. What you do every day at work, that reflects on somebody else's life because you're responsible for that maintenance on the aircraft. If you don't take your job 110% seriously, you could take that person's life in your hands. So you have to sort of have a bond there. Two of her colleagues were killed in a crash this summer during the intense workup training leading up to their deployment. Because of the unpredictable nature of their mission and the special operations they must be able to perform, all of the different specialties that make up the expeditionary unit spent the previous six months working together on a variety of tactical scenarios they might encounter, including biological attacks and urban combat. All right, drop your gear off, come right back. The guys I've been, we've been together about a year and a half, six months with this MU. Uh, we've trained together, we've trained hard together. These guys are chomping a bit, hey, we're gonna do something, we're gonna do something. I mean, they're ready. They really are. This is, this is what they joined the Marine Corps for, to get in the action. Gunnery Sergeant John Halpin is part of the Marines' elite force reconnaissance platoon, the eyes and ears of the unit, which goes into new areas or behind enemy lines in advance of the main force. The mission, to locate military targets and terrorist groups. The people that are already in Afghanistan um, our job is just that much more critical to get the reconnaissance, to find out, pinpoint where those groups may be. We're professional soldiers, whereas these terrorist groups, they're not professional, unorganized. I mean, any Yahoo can, can 
can take a uh, car full explosive and drive it into something. All right. With us, we're more disciplined, well organized, and we're well structured. That makes a difference. The major difference for Gunnery Sergeant John Halpin on this, his fourth deployment, is being able to communicate with his wife by email, even if he can't disclose where he is or what he's doing. It's turned into a bit of a competition with his neighbor, Gunnery Sergeant David Hargrove, and their wives living across the street from each other back at Camp Lejeune, where they were able to view this videotape we recorded on the ship. Well, we, we compete on, on who gets the most email or who gets who get emails the most. I did that. So I email about every, every day or every other day. And he asks me to email a day. So as soon as he talks to me, he goes back to his room and starts emailing. <laughs> We haven't been off the ship too much, but, uh, you know, things are going okay. Morale's good. Uh, just keep your emails coming. Austin, don't give your I don't ever ask him where he's at. Um, if he volunteers the information to me, then that's great and fine, but I never ask. Um, there are times I have, you know, like ideas, like I knew where he went recently, you know, but obviously I didn't know until he got there. I mean, he's not ever going to tell me something he's not allowed to say or couldn't say. You just, you just have to be strong. You can't dwell on it. You know, you have to go on with your everyday life and, and you know, the child's going to walk and the child's going to get potty trained. It's just, <laughs> you can't, you know, you cannot go. You've got to go on with everyday life. As part of everyday life at sea, each evening, Marines and sailors share a quiet moment of reflection led by the ship's chaplain. Turn. The first order to send in the Marines comes off the coast of Egypt. Nineteen days after leaving home, the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit gets its first assignment. All right, let's head up, let's go. Operation Bright Star in northern Egypt. A desert training exercise with coalition forces. The timing and location make it their last dress rehearsal with live ammunition and their first show of force in the region. This is not just a training exercise. This could be, you know, something where we just need to be prepared for, for whatever. So it's hard to compare it with the past because the world has changed here recently in the last six, seven weeks. As the commanding officer of the unit, one of Colonel Andrew Frick's first objectives is to move 2,200 people and over 200 armored vehicles and trucks ashore in a single day, according to the Marine Corps motto, by air, land, and sea. I hate to say it's a logistics nightmare, it's, it's a logistics challenge. But we, we know what we need to sustain ourselves for the first 24 hours and followed by the next 24 and so on. And that's the way we pack the stuff so that as it comes off, it, nine times out of 10, it's the thing you need next anyway. All right, ready to go. Get up, son. All right, let's head up, let's go. Stay motivated, ready to go. Conveying the appropriate urgency to the troops is the specialty of the sergeant major. Motivation high. Uh -huh. Motivation high, but this is what we train for. Uh -huh. I mean, you go through six months of work up, and we know it's all game and play. Then you get something like what happened on the 11th of September this year. Marines get motivated. Everybody and everything on the three ships is given a number and a precise offloading sequence, which moves them toward their helicopters on the flight deck. Or their landing crafts below decks. We probably got 120, 150 pounds right now with all this gear. Gunnery Sergeant Halpin's reconnaissance platoon will go ashore by helicopter, carrying everything they need to function immediately. Corporal Bonsay's demolition unit is already ashore, where it meets up with support gear coming from another ship. 
we've done a lot of micromanagement of the customer to understand what he's going to need in the first 24 to 48 hours. We know that water, chow, and ammo are the three biggest things that the customer is going to need up front. The Colonel's focus on customer care for his Marines is part technical necessity and partly a result of his previous assignment, working with the Sears Robux Logistics Group for a management exchange. On the critical first day going ashore, he moves quickly from ship to shore to remote outposts to guarantee same-day delivery of everything they need. In a matter of hours, the Marines turn an empty patch of desert into a fully functioning forward military base. What makes them different from most military units and true to their expeditionary nature, they must be totally self-sustaining for the first 15 days wherever they are sent. The combat elements set up remote camps throughout the area, which they'll move almost daily for both security and training purposes. At the same time, the support elements construct a headquarters base near an Egyptian army facility. It will eventually include a full surgical hospital, gym, chapel, satellite telephones, and full internet connectivity and a military strength laundry manned by a rifle squad of Marines. Well, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> a strikingly non-military mess hall offers two hot meals a day for the troops who can get back to the main base. Check your weapon for clear. Both mess decks are open. But only after they have made sure to clear their weapons for safety reasons and wash their hands for hygiene purposes. The same combat support equipment and expertise the Marines use to build a base in less than 24 hours can also be used for humanitarian missions, like their past assignments in Somalia, Albania, and Rwanda. A humanitarian mission is just as likely in the context of this crisis as a combat assault. Our focus area is really to relieve the initial suffering. We have food, we have water. Uh, we can provide that immediately on site, within an hour. We bring general purpose tents, much like you see out here today. And again, we can have those up to su in support of about 300 men, women, and children in the course of three hours. Knowing that they may be called into combat at any time, the Marines go through drills like these to prepare for treating real casualties. Yes. We have all the normal trauma resuscitation uh, equipment that you would expect from uh, be able to put chest tubes in, uh, IVs, fluids, uh, antibiotics, to uh, just the basic human comfort items uh, that you would need, such as sanitary napkins, diapers, soap. We are very much like the Peace Corps in terms of our, our compassion and our comfort and our trying to rebuild, but we do still carry uh, weapons uh, for security purposes. When we return, the Marine Reconnaissance Team hooks up with coalition forces as a special operations rehearsal new urgency.